Welcome to Deconstructing History, the podcast about all things living history and reenacting. I am your host, Mike Baker. For our very first episode today, we're going to talk about how to get into reenacting, what it takes to start a portrayal, and the trials and tribulations of uh, doing one. In today's episode, I'm going to be helped out by a distinguished panel of guests. You're going to hear from Andy Volpe from Legio 3 Karanaika, a Roman reenacting group, as well as Carolyn Bigelow, who's another member of Legio 3 and the state historian for the Massachusetts Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, we'll also hear from Nadim Ahmad of Eran Oud Turan and Matt Blazik of the Agincourt Soldier and the Popham Soldier, who also does the podcast How to Medieval with our final guest, um, Ari, of the Turnip of Terror. And if you think the Turnip of Terror causes fright, uh, I'll just let you know that there is such a thing called armored turnips in uh, the medieval world. And because we had such wonderful long discussions with everybody, uh, we're going to split our first episode up into two episodes because we do cover a lot of ground. And without further ado, um, on to our questions and our guests. Starting with Ari, how did everybody get their start in reenacting and living history? So I've always been really interested in fantasy. When I was a kid, I read a lot of fantasy, and it was a lot of sword and sorcery fantasy is in addition to sci-fi. And so I've always had this per peripheral interest in medieval stuff as well as history in general and you you'd go in a, a modern world civilization class in high school and i'd know all the names of all the pieces of the armor but i couldn't remember anything else from the lesson because i wasn't paying attention because i was focusing on the things i actually liked and when i got out of high school i actually fell into a living history job now it was 19th century 1834 was the real main stay of the job i did there but it was a job i i worked there 60 hours a week in costume in in a different time period so to speak being in a what you call it, you know effectively an interpreter though it was it was less free form interpretation it was more of a scripted program that the children used to key into one of their state standards for social studies and history but it was through the work of the ocean institute doing 19th century living history that i really found that i loved the historical authenticity aspect of medievally themed recreations because I had you know, LOTR style costumes that you dress up and go watch the movies premiere in. And I had been tangibly in the SCA off and on periodically, but it was really the focus on historical authenticity that brought me into reenacting specifically. And my interest in that has just never really waned. And that's what's bred into all the other things I've gotten involved in. And I've returned to the medieval era because it is the, the one I find most interesting. I mean, there are lots of other interesting time periods, of course, but I, I think medieval is really my favorite for that's a whole, a whole completely different conversation. And Matt, how about you? So it, it's actually kind of convoluted. All of my uh, background comes from theater. I was big into theater in high school and also in college. My, my, my minor in college is actually theater. And I, when I was a teenager, I got it into my head. You know, when all my friends were doing musicals, I got it into my head that I would rather do Shakespeare. So I, whenever I got the chance, I, I did Shakespeare. And I, I don't know, I, I always, I know that sort of that typical answer of, well, in my blood, I grew up with these stories of King Arthur and Knights of the Round Table and, and things like that. And it's true. I, I did grow up in that. Um, and I always wanted to be a, a, a jouster. But because of the, the theater background, I actually was part of a stage combat Renaissance fair troupe um, called Chivalry Arms. We used to run our own Ren Fair up here in, in Waldeboro, Maine. This was uh, 20, 20 years ago, or probably even closer to 25 years ago now. So we, I started that that medieval from the that theatrical side of it, being fantasy fair medieval ish, and I then joined in college. I joined the SCA as a lot of us do. But when I joined it, I, I said to myself, you know, well, this is I thought I right, I said this is an educational organization. 
So I got to do this right. L- little did I, I know what, what the SCA actually is and is about. I, not to be down on it because it's a lot of fun. I'm still a member and I still have a lot of fun, but it's not this pure academic, really reenactor organization that some people think it is. But, but, but that's what I thought it was. That's how I sort of approached it is if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. I'm going to be historical. I'm going to be accurate, as accurate as I possibly can. So luckily um, at the time, I was actually an English major at the University of Southern Maine. And I was sort of focusing on, you know, medieval and Renaissance literature at the time. So I took a couple of history classes as well, well-rounded. And I really learned through the, being the English major and then taking those history classes of, of how you can analyze text. So when I started analyzing these, you know, medieval and Renaissance texts that I had to read for school, I would then sort of follow it up by actually researching the history behind it. You know, they, they would talk about certain things of clothing that I didn't know what they were. So I would, I would go digging for what those were, you know, what events, what really happened in these events, like in Henry V, Shakespeare's Henry V, what really happened, what really went on. And I found in doing that, just try, just trying to make, you know, get a better understanding of what I was reading about in these plays and literature, I found that the real stories were even more fascinating than the you know propaganda about it so i learned that i really did have a love of history and real history and then learning about history and sharing that love of history and that's when i really decided you know that that i want to be a really a reenactor or if not even a reenactor a living history interpreter and and i want to learn about these time periods and really try to interpret what their life was and and how they went about it so that that's really how I got involved in all this. I mean, a lot of the stuff I do on my own, I'm not really part of a reenacting group um, because nobody up around here really does the time period that I do. Uh, I, I've had talks with friends about trying to start one, maybe, but it hasn't really panned out. So yeah, a lot of it I do it like as a living history interpreter, just on my own, trying to just better for myself, better understand. And once I feel that I have a better understanding, try to share it with others so they can better understand too. Caroline? Well, I started when I was still living in Colorado, and I've always really been interested in uh, Greek and Roman history, specifically the mythology. I loved the myths about the stars. My father had told me them when I was really young and was a huge fan of Hercules' legendary journeys, young Hercules and Xena. And so I went about looking at Renaissance festivals for different kinds of reenactors. And there were no Greek reenactors back, you know, in the early 2000s, at least not in my part of Colorado, but I did find some Romans and I said, huh, well, the Romans love the Greeks. So I, you know, I would love to join you guys. And I did, I was the only woman in that group, Uh, but I still had a lot of fun. You know, it was kind of interesting being the only woman in a group of, at that time, about 10, guys so it's kind of been consistently inconsistent about reenacting since then and how about you andy all right um so i started doing the reenacting thing um through the higgins army museum which i uh kind of a kind of a double whammy i started as the um on the staff of the overnight program where the cub scouts will come in and we'd feed them pizza take them a tour through the museum do an arms and armor presentation and then you know they they roll out um um, blankets and stuff and sleep in the quest gallery and I did that for for a couple months and um, I you know you back in high school you couldn't have paid me to do a presentation in front of the class and then all of a sudden you know add, add a couple sources to the mix and I was like okay I, I think I might like this and around the same time I started um, joining the what became the Higgins Armory Sword Guild where we researched and demonstrated to the public um, 16th and um, 16th century mostly, uh, arms and armor, sword, sword play, uh, swords, halberds, um, basically any of the weapons that showed up in the manuals, we try to get replicas of them and then try to show it to the public of what we were reading. And I did that for a couple of years. And then I um, also at the same time, I, I the, uh, they had a Roman arms and armor presentation, but it wasn't, the guy who was doing it wasn't wearing the armor because uh, he had a really bad back and, uh, and stuff like that. And they came to they came to me and said, well, you know, you, you really like doing the arms and armor programs. How would you like to wear the armor and actually do the presentation? And I'm like, sure, let's do it. And I, I started that around 
2001, 2002, and I've been doing it ever since. And, um, you know, the first two or three years of doing it, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm only going to do Roman. That's the only period I'm ever going to do. And, you know, maybe about three years after that, it was, I ended up in like four more groups. So <laughs> there we go. Um, and uh, yeah, now, now I'm, I'm in control of the third Legion Karanaika. Um, and we've been doing programs with Higgins Armory and now the collection and everything moved over to the Worcester Art Museum. We've been doing programs there for um, since that got moved over around 2013. And I've been going to schools and um, a couple other museums here and there doing the Roman thing um, since about 2003. And finally, Nadim. Oh, it's um, kind of something I always wanted to do, but I didn't realize it was a thing that people actually did until. So in university, um, I was part of the Archery Society, and a few guys in the Archery Society were also in the Reenactment Society. So I tagged along with them for a few sessions. Um, I was mainly interested in, in horse riding. Um, so we went to some stables who were looking for riders for their newly forming Roman Reenactment Group. Um, and... Um, this is going to be my first time doing everything. And they explained, you know, you got to get your own kit and, and uh, turn to trainings and do that kind of stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. But I don't, I'm not really that interested in the Romans. So I'm going to do some Sasanian stuff. If that's okay. Like, yeah, that's fine. Um, and that's how I got started. Um, essentially, it's just tagging along with this, um, with this historic equitation group. Um, now, over time, my interests have, have shifted from Sasanian Iran to um, Central Asia in the early medieval period, um, primarily due to um, the source material, because there are there's actual source material for Central Asia, and and getting any source material for Sasanian is pretty impossible. So, could you quickly kind of take us through your process of starting a portrayal, um, like sort of what goes into that for you? So when I Start a portrayal. The most recent portrayal I started is the uh, Popham soldier portrayal, the 1607 Popham calling. Uh, I did that because I realized it'd be a great way for my organization to branch out and include some main history because Popham colony is fairly local to where I, I live in Maine. I, I grew up close by going to the beaches near it. So when I looked into that, the first thing I really did, believe it or not, is I looked at the archaeological reports and built it backwards from that so you know I, I want to see well what what tools did do we know that they actually had and what you know what did they bring with them what did they find there so once I learned that I then started searching archives and, and luckily Maine has some copies of these because it's part of Maine history for any and just any information regarding the pop and colony and, and there's not a lot because it was very short-lived and it was very sort of anticlimactic and just sort of petered out and didn't turn into anything but I was able, that that I found those really fascinating now because there was a lot of information and even the archaeological finds they didn't find that much I sort of had to compare it and I, I knew Jamestown was contemporary and from you know the same company actually it's a different branch it was a sister colony it was a different branch of the same company so I went and actually started doing a deep dive of what they knew about Jamestown and sort of extrapolating information ab about that making educated guesses as to well they probably had a lot of the same gear you know the, a lot of the same reasons for going into it were, were, were probably very similar so i was able to build a story and, and i think it's really I and mean, you asked sort of give me the method about it when you asked me where i start from this i think i when i start for these i look for the story what is the story that's looking to be told through this about this time in history um and while I don't focus, you know, I generally do third person interpretation. I don't focus on, you know, I'm not George Popham, the leader of the colony or anything. Like that. I'm sort of the generic everyman, both for like the Popham colony, but also for the Ashen Corps soldier. When I do that, I'm just sort of the, the everyman soldier of that. I'm not portraying anybody specific, but I, I will think it also doing that gives people a good primer of, you know, what to expect as a norm of what was happening and i'm not portraying some you know extreme example of, of, of somebody who's very very rich who was part of this who had all this weird you know weird stuff so it's i look for the story the, the most the, the story that could be most identified with by the people i'm trying to tell it to and, and finding the story is the best way to go about guiding your research into these because i i don't really need to know about what animal husbandry methods 
they tried at Pop and Colony because that's not part of my story. Um, but you have to be honest about that. If somebody asks you, it's like, well, did they did they breed farm animals? I'm like, I don't know. They may have tried, but I don't I don't really know how they went about that. But I might be able to find out for you if I do some digging or talk to some people. They could probably probably help with that. So a lot of this is sort of I approach it with a certain level of academic honesty and and, and, and integrity of be got to be purpose of uh, you know not per purposely honest of what you don't know and what you're sort of extrapolating from from lots of different information. Well, I came to my current impression. I kind of slid into it. I started it about a half a generation before and then settled into where I am now. The real reason I chose the late 14th century, early 15th century was entirely because I liked the way armor of that era looks. It's very transitional. I like to think of it as, think of those wonky tanks in World War I where you took a tractor and put armor on it and a big gun and, hey, look, you have a tank, but you didn't really know how to make a tank yet. I found that there's that sense of we're figuring it out when it comes to plate armor. The late 15th century armor is gorgeous. It's the knight in shining armor. It's the apex of plate armor, but that's it's also a little too refined. I like to think of it as the original trilogy verse Phantom Menace. You've got these incredibly polished, shiny, finished Naboo cruisers, and they're not Star Wars-y to me. The the open panel, you see the guts of the X-Wing is Star Wars-y to me. And the late 14th century, when you're starting to have this combination between what was previously a full male outfit, but not quite a full plate outfit. And it's this good hybridization between the two. And there's lots of exposed mail and there's plates. And some of the plates are large and fully encompassing because the technology has developed, but not all of it because they haven't applied it to everywhere. And, and they haven't developed large sweeping pauldrons. So you still have these floating rondels. And there's just a lot of interplay between two real defining features in medieval pre-gunpowder armor, which is, You've got on the one end of the spectrum, your fully articulated, all-encompassing plate. And previous to that, you have your fully from head to toe male. And both of those, I don't know, I like the blend between the two. And then I eventually started just developing a impression around the time period that I wanted. So I started 1396. And the reasons for that specific date are because of a gap in historical record based off of who was... We have we know for a fact who was the sheriff of Cheshire for most of medieval England's history, but eh, there's a gap where in 1396 there's no recorded name for who was filling that position. And so I started my impression saying 1396 that my impression could be the sheriff of Cheshire as a gentry impression. However, my interests in the history surrounding the Battle of Agincourt, which, you know, obviously everyone loves and gravitates towards, and the fact that some of the elements of that, that sort of combination Mad Maxi plate that also has a little more of these advanced features that make it look a little, little more upscale, but still has that blending of, of older style armor pieces, pushed me sort of forward into about 10 plus or minus. So I kind of aimed to the left and then moved up. And that's how I developed my impression entirely. I took something I really liked the look of, which was the armor. And then I started to explore the history that is authentic to that time period. And then once I started realizing that there were aspects of history from a different time period adjacent that I preferred, I slowly adjusted my impression to accommodate all of my interests without compromising by taking two things that were non-contemporaneous and mushing them together? Oh, that's a big question. Um, the answer I would give now is probably very different than the answer I would give when I was starting or, or, or a few years ago. Um, so right now, so um, because we, we focus on Sogdiana in the early medieval period, there's actually very good um, Im image um, pictorial evidence in the form of wall paintings, as well as pretty decent ones for, for most of the bits, bits and pieces that we need. Um, I would say the first... Um, the starting point should be the wall paintings of Penchant, um, because by and large, the images are fairly accessible. Um, you know, they've been posted on multiple um, 
even some of the less well-known ones. And and for the super niche ones that aren't really published in that much detail uh, online, you can find them usually in English, English language or sometimes Russian as well. Um, the archaeology is a bit harder to find. Um, and this is usually published pretty much exclusively in, in Russian language journals or more recently being published in Uzbek and Tajik language um, articles as well. Um, but um, thankfully, the look up who's is uh, the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World based in New York have uploaded um, like decades and decades and decades of Soviet um, Soviet literature from Central Asia. So that's quite handy. Uh, handy is a good start to look for stuff. Um, yeah, I think starting with start with wall paintings because that gives you your overall schematic of how things should look, and then use the archaeology to flesh out the. Details. Say you have paintings of paintings of, of banqueters from Penjikan. Um, Okay, well they're wearing these specific coats. Well, we have coats like this found from here, 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 and here. You know, they're wearing these belts. Well, they have belt plates from these archaeological contexts. They have a knife and copy that from this site. We have a belt purse. We can copy that from this site. So it it really is is painting based, um, and we're using the archaeology to flesh out the details. Um, I don't really use textual sources in my work um, unless it's something that I'm really struggling with. So for me, um, going as you know a woman, I really didn't want to do the arms and armor and be the military aspect. I've always been more interested in the, the common people culture and civilian life. So when I did my Roman stuff, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of information on Roman women. I mean, there's a lot of images that you find from places like Pompeii and some frescoes, things like that, uh, and mosaics. But, you know, in the written literature, there's not a ton. So um, I guess for me, I started on which class, uh, social class I would like to go in on and I really at the time didn't have the money to do high end, um, like, um, you know, the, the family of the empire or the emperor, that whole you know, class. So I went more lower class, like the common people, the plebeian class, and um, did some research on the kind of materials that they would use um, and what I could actually find in the local stores. Um, for Roman women uh, of my rank, it would be more like wool and linen. Wool these days is hideously expensive and the quality is more for suiting and that's not really what I wanted. So I went for linen because it's, you know, you can find it places, it's a little more expensive than cotton, but it's really comfortable. You can find it, it comes in a bunch of colors. I looked up some patterns online, um, Legion 20, which is down in the Washington DC area, their website was a huge help to me. So a lot of internet research really. And um, luckily my mother's a seamstress. So she was able to guide me through a lot of the creation of my outfit. Um, and it really just starts out with uh, the Roman dress, the woman's dress. Um, and then you kind of add things from there. So you can go with a pair of shoes. Now they had a lot of leather. So you go for sandals, you do belts and Roman hairstyles. I had long hair at the time, so I was able to put it up in a bun. And, you know, that was pretty much it. So for me, it really just comes down to figuring out which kind of class of person that you want to portray. Um, if they're going to be male or female, where if they're living at the time. So if you're living in Rome, you're going to, it's a warm climate. So you're going to have to dress for a warmer climate as opposed to a colder climate. And then just start making things, talking to people who are in your group and saying, hey, does this seem appropriate for what we're trying to do or not? And, you know, modifying it from there. Like it's once you have the basis of an outfit, like for me, a dress and some sandals, you can kind of go from there, you know, start acquiring pieces here and there um, as you move forward. You know, try to try to figure out what kind of help or you, either if you're helping somebody or if you're doing it yourself, try to search online for groups that are that are doing it um even if they're not in, uh, not local or in your own state um you know that can be really difficult because um sometimes either the group might be like one or two people or they may not even be quote unquote active they may not be going to events or doing stuff um there there are some like uh they kind of like research societies and things like that that so they're not really interested necessarily in um going out into a field field event like a timeline and, and dressing up and doing it uh they're they're kind of like happy to 
bury their nose in the books and, and kind of discuss, which is all fine. That that's you know it's, it's whatever you're whatever you're looking for and look looking to get out of this hobby of of reenacting and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, the, the first thing I would kind of do is probably try to find the group if I haven't found one already that like got me inspired or got me interested to 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 look at that time period and look at that portrayal and say, okay, I want to do this, and then start pegging them with questions. You know, like you know how you where do you start? Where do you go? You know, get a list of vendors and you know, recommendations and, and um, vendors and makers and things like that. Uh, but also just try, I would, I also highly encourage people to try making the stuff themselves, whatever they can, you know, um, competent seems uh, at tailoring or whatever, you know, there, there's plenty of people out there that can, that can help you with that. Um, and even like Legion 20's site, they, uh, Matt, Matthew Ampton did such a good job of showing kind of the bare bones aspect of it of you know this is how you get the you know take the pattern copy it on a paper you know make paper mock-ups first things like that and then just try it and if it doesn't work you know don't freak out try it again and you know try to figure out what what you did wrong and um always compared to museum photos of actual artifacts if you can get get a hold of that uh contact museums and things like that um uh kind of lost my train of thought there yeah, yeah, from from the very very beginning of it, yeah, it's it's that try to find a group so you can kind of learn from from their initial mistakes and just dive into it. Just try try getting pattern, try getting the clothing. Um, you know, do the do the best you can starting out, and just go into it knowing you're constantly going to be making revisions. If you're into this for you know the accuracy standpoint, from trying to be accurate and trying to be correct and trying to be always improving yourself and always improving your research it's going to be a lifelong forever however long you're in the hobby and as long as you enjoy doing that um and you're getting something out of that you know it's gonna it's it's gonna fuel itself um uh, from both from both sides um and you know don't be afraid to, to make complete revisions in your kit and uh you know a little bit of a humbleness too is you know you, you could start off tomorrow and, and think you have a, a fantastic kit and it's like totally accurate and then the next year you know, you find a book or you find a museum or you find a, an artifact or, or the archaeologists find an artifact that says, you know what, we, um, we thought we had this right and we're completely wrong. And you kind of have to start all over again in some aspects. But that's, that's part of the course. You know, e even people who do um, LARPing and, and uh, or just hobby stuff, um, sometimes you just have to start all over because things will break. And sometimes you're like, all right, well, maybe I shouldn't use this particular material or, or this leather was really bad or, or use the wrong kind of fabric. Uh, I need to try it with this one. So that's kind of how you start doing it. Uh, you know, someone who may watch one of your programs and be like, man, I want to do that. Or, you know, up and coming reenactors or, or those who want to get into the hobby. I, I think one of the most common phrases I, I've heard spoken to new reenactors or, or those who are just starting out is, you know, go do your research. And, and so what does go do your research mean to you? But, you know, also what, what is the process for like, you know, do your research? Sure. Um, as an aside, um, I, I find the phrase do your research actually fairly unhelpful for new reenactors. Because um, I don't know about, about you or, or many of the people, but like myself, I didn't come into reenacting as, as a, as a, from a, a history or, or even a humanities background so do your research um for me it, it was kind of like okay what does that involve you know um, and i kind of had to refine my method over well over the past decade maybe, um to come up with a sort of more scientific um or more accurate um way of going about things um but i, I think for for a newbie starting um saying go to your research is actually really unhelpful um what what people need is they need to be pointed to specific books, articles, uh, web pages, whatever, um, that we know of good quality. And so, you know, we can say, um, instead of just saying, go to your research, we say, we say, you know, go to your research. Um, here's a bibliography, um, read this, and then look up some of the references in some of these texts as well. Um, but obviously it, it depends from context to context. So, so do your research for me would, would involve, you know, reading, or at least, you know, looking at the pictures in, in all the various publications of the Penjikant wall paintings, and then kind of trawling through some of the um, archaeological works in Tajikistan and the um, history of material culture of Uzbekistan journals to, you know, fish out some. Um, but again, it, it's context. So, yeah. First, I, I think it's sort of a horrible and dismissive 
phrase to tell somebody who comes up to you and says, I want to do this. I'm interested. How do I get involved or, or how do I continue? You know, how do I get into this? And you just say, oh, go do your research. Because that's basically putting the onus on them to help themselves when really, I mean, come on, guys, we don't have a ton of people knocking down our doors to want to be reenactors anymore. Almost every single area of reenactment is slowly losing members and not gaining new members. We should be, the first thing we should say to them is, well, what do you, what is it do you want to do? Do you know? Do you want to do what I'm doing? Do you want to do something else? What do you find fascinating about this? And if they say, well, I want to be a knight. All right, great. Let's look at or see if we can find somebody who knows which direction to point you in. And if it's something that you know about, if they say to me, it's like, oh, I want to be a, a pop and soldier pikeman. Like, great. So first, you know what the pop and soldier, what the pop and colony is. And like, no, I don't. It's like nothing. You, so I would recommend, you know, read about the pop and colony. That's probably gonna be a secondary source just to start. And secondary sources can actually be a really good start. I know a lot of reenactors, a lot of, you know, Researchers like, oh, not secondary sources. Don't ever give them that. Like, they can actually be a really good place to start because most secondary sources aren't written for hardcore, even tertiary sources, they're not written for hardcore researchers and academics. They're written for the casual reader who's just getting into it, who wants a overview of the era that they're talking. So secondary or tertiary can be a great starting point. And then when they read something like one of my one of my favorite books for the Agincourt era is um, Agincourt, and it's by Juliet Parker, and it's an excellent reading book. It's full of information, but it's not ridiculously dry and academic. Which I mean, you got to admit, a lot of our stuff can be really dry and academic. I mean, I, I read an amazing book on um, livery collars. I just finished it up, but it was one of the driest things ever because all it was was names and dates and places it was still fascinating to me though but so once they've read sort of the the secondary you'd be like so you know what'd you think oh you know, i loved it it's like what part of that did you love oh i love the archers i love the story of the english archers like great let's start finding you information on english archers and then we can point them to some of the big names like ann curry for that era leah barker um Desmond Sewer, he's a little older and a little, yeah, but a lot of things, you know, we can start putting that information and then using those secondary sources, using the primary sources that they cite, that gives you a path to follow to finding these primary sources. And then once you find these primary sources, you can start finding other primary sources for these. Once you learn how to find the primary source, that's one of the biggest challenges, especially if you're doing medieval reenactment in the United States, is finding a lot of these primary sources because I can't go down the road to the local library that's been around since 1100 and find you know these manuscripts that have these primary sources. We have to do it all online. So in the U.S., we have to have a better idea of what we're looking at when we're looking at these things online to make sure that they're right and that they're correct. And we need to talk to each other as reenactors and help new reenactors talk to each other. Because it can be hard as a newcomer to sort of break into these circles and become somebody that, you know, feels comfortable asking people who've been around for, for questions and ideas and, and um, you know, guidance. But I think we as reenactors, especially the ones that have been around for doing this a while, we need to be more open to helping these people learn more because I mean, in the end, that's what we're trying to do is edu educate people. These people are just looking for a little more education than our common everyday viewer who just shows rolls up to the reenactment to watch us fight. So for me, go do your research. It's such a broad catchphrase, especially these days. Um, and I know coming to it as a woman, it you know, means something kind of differently. So for us, it's basically um, that you that your perspective doesn't match mine, and you're wrong. So you need to research until you see that I'm right. Whether or not that's the case, who knows? Um, and so I use it as um, an opportunity to say, hey, all right, so research, where would you like me to research? What resources are you using? How can you help me understand what your perspective is. I mean, if, if there's a reason for me to change my kit or something that I'm doing, I definitely will, you know, especially look into it. 
Um, but if I don't have any context as to why I need to change it and in what ways, it's not especially helpful. So, um, you know, I'd ask them to kind of give me more. And if they don't, a lot of times I just discount what they say because, you know, we're having a difference of opinion and opinions are not facts. They may seem like it sometimes, but they're not. So, um, you know, unless they can lead me to places like they may not have the exact article or the author of whatever it is but if they can say hey some new research was done in Egypt of last year or in France two years ago or you know maybe five years ago okay you know I can start to look at that and at least get some more information to uh, maybe do adapt my kit because it you know it may not be accurate it may not who knows i think go do your research is probably one of the least helpful things that a reenactor can say to somebody who's got the guts up to approach them about a question so we do all of this research into our impression and it's not like this is some sort of professional information that we need to keep secret and so when someone has the guts to a give you the compliment that, hey, your impression is good enough that I see you as a pseudo authority. And so when someone says, go do your research, I really find that to be a, an incredibly unsatisfying actor, uh, answer. And I, there's something that frustrates me when you have an impression that is good enough that someone else has seen it, admired it, respected your research as a semi-authority, and then likewise, got the guts up to come and talk to you about it because they're interested in knowledge and what does do your research really mean because if they knew where to look for this information they why would they have talked to you about it they came to you because they were looking for advice they were looking for some mentorship they were hoping that you would help guide them through because they respect the fact that you were able to come up to a conclusion that they found worthy of admiration and so i don't know really how to answer that question because go do your research doesn't really mean anything. What research do you want to do? Because what timeline are you looking to get? Now, if I receive that question, and I receive that question a little differently than some other people do because a lot of the public information that I put out there is pan medieval. With the Turn Up the Terror Project, I try to address the reenactment medieval specific reenactment culture as a whole and so i do a lot of content that addresses a very wide time period so generally i don't have the answer to a lot of people's questions in that regard uh, though i do have a lot of answers to the the very specific narrow impression that i do from my own personal impression and so when someone asks me a question my my goal is to guide them to the right answer it's you lead a horse to water obviously the rest of that adage no longer applies. So there's a lot of negative work that is involved if you go do independent research and you make mistakes. And you have to learn from those mistakes, you have to revise those mistakes. And when I say negative work, that comes in the cost of, of money sunk into projects that then have to be scrapped or are replaced. It comes into time. It comes into your social proof as if, there, if you come off as uh, knowledgeable, you have to then overcome that, that stigma in the future. People remember, and if it's bad enough, and you have to spend more time in research, and perhaps if you spent enough time researching the wrong thing, then you have this discouragement from the hobby as a whole because you weren't getting out of it what you thought you were going to get into it and spent so much time not realizing that you weren't going to get where you wanted to be in the end. How does this help the hobby as a whole when instead, if you as a reenactor have someone who's receptive and interested in the information you have to provide for them, you help them avoid some of these mistakes in the future, and then they have a full career with which to do research that builds on top of what you've already established as worthwhile to know, and they can make new mistakes in the future that will then benefit the hobby as a whole when those particular misconceptions that maybe are just not addressed because they haven't had the opportunity to get addressed, then become thought of and proven right or wrong and research is done and, and we all have access to that new improved information. So go to research means nothing. I would prefer to send you to someone who I know has the answer or and, and we'll talk to you about it or send you to a repository of information where I know that answer is. So say, I never want someone to come to me. And I think 
I think the urge to say, go do your research is because they want, they don't want to be the person that somebody else uses as a source. So for instance, I don't ever want someone to say, I'm wearing this hat in my impression because Ari said so. That's not good enough. No matter how proficient I become, even if, you know, I'm no doctor in medieval studies, but even if I were a doctor in medieval hats of the 14th century, I wouldn't want you to tell the public that the reason that you think this piece of equipment is appropriate to your impression and time period is because some guy on the internet who really, has a lot of social authority said so. I want you to internalize the information and be able to have personal knowledge and authority on why. So I'll tell you, I wear this hat because, and I can tell you the information I know, but I'm also going to tell you where I got that information from. Because perhaps, perhaps you go do some independent research of your own, and then you can say to the, the public, or you can say at an immersion event where you're discussing kit around the fire, you could say, well, I chose this hat specifically because of the its location in this manuscript miniature and its reference in these inventories. And I know this information because I was led there by art. That's the closest I ever want to get to being someone's reason why they have some thought about historical fact or your culture is I know this because I did the research and I found the research because he helped me get there. And that's how you should tell someone to go do the research. You just need to bring them to the research. And if you don't know the answer to that question, and if you don't have the resources to answer that question, you should help find someone who does because at some point, if someone asks you for help and you turn them down often enough, then we're either going to get a lot of bad impressions or we're going to have people who could have given us great impressions leave the hobby because they don't feel included. All right. So when I hear go do your research, um, it, it I, I'm in very much the same boat that Ari is, what, what he mentioned in regards that you, you know, we, we, we fall into this trap as new reenactors uh, or young or young people getting into the hobby, blah, 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 where they, you know, like, say they get an Osprey book and they flip through it and they get to the illustrations. It's like, Oh, I want to do figure B from plate two. You know, I want that. I want to do that. Cause that looks totally badass. And that's it. That's they, they don't go any further than that. They don't really look at the back index and find out where they're getting, where the artist is getting their information from. Um, and then they might do something like hit uh, cult of Athena. And it's not a, it's not a slander against the, the site or the vendors. Um, yeah, the, the makers vary between really good and really horrible. Um, and they, you know, they see the first thing that looks close enough and they buy it and then they show up at an event and it's like, that's not really what I asked you to get. You, you know, um, I, I've been, uh, I was listening to Ari earlier and I, I've been trying to think about this question because Mike, Mike kind of said this to me before too with, and trying to think about it leading up to this, that, um, you know, we're lucky with my group, the Third Legion Kiranaika, in that we now have, I think, a pretty substantial list of references and materials that we can point to and say, all right, you want more information on this, you know, start here, read this book here, you know, and kind of go from there. Um, but I'm trying to think back to when we first started, and, you know, we only had so much information. And especially with ancient Roman archaeology, the research and the re-research that's been going on in the last 15, 20 years has been astounding. You know, what, what I thought I knew when I started in 2002 is completely different from what I, what I do now. Very, very little of my, well, my kit really hasn't changed that much, but how I interpret it and how I talk about it has changed quite a bit. Um, so yeah, when you, when you come across people who are like, well, it's like, well, where are you coming? Where did you get the, the information for this? It's not, is never trying to be insulting and saying like, well, you know, your, your kid is complete crap. It's, well, wh where did you, you know, wh where'd you come up with that? You know, wh where did you, what led you to that? And they might say, well, I, you know, I, I, my buddy said, said to get this or the website said it was accurate. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's a pretty easy trap too. You know, the vendors are there to make money. They're not there to help you improve your kit and be the, the most fantastical living historian who ever lived. Um, that's, that's just a utopia that doesn't exist. That is all for the first part of this episode. Tune in for the second half, where our esteemed guests will talk more about uh, reenacting and their experiences with reenacting and living history. I am your host, Mike Baker, and this is Deconstructing History.